Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which time zone you are in. Uh, my name is Shomitra Datta, and I'm honored to be the panel moderator for this panel this morning in the Horeca of India conference. The title of the panel is Supply Chain Evolution Post-COVID. Clearly, COVID is a very important theme in today's uh, Horace's conference and also today's uh, world. And I would like to begin by, of course, hoping that all of you, panel members, uh, attendees, and other guests, are all safe and healthy, keeping yourself and your family healthy is the most important priority for all of us. Yet, as we navigate the COVID world today, uh, it's also important for us to be able to look at the future. And of course, look at the future uh, in the special context of India. What kind of a future of India create for itself? What kind of possibilities exist for India in the future? And to discuss this, we have five wonderful panel members. And the specific topic of discussion today in this panel is a supply chain. Uh, supply chains have been a very important theme of discussion, I think, not just in the COVID and post-COVID environment, but also, I think, pre-COVID, given the kind of uh, responses, given the kind of positions taken by the current Trump administration in the U.S., uh, certainly there were concerns being raised about China as China's influence in the global supply chain already pre-COVID. So in many ways, the COVID world or COVID phenomena has accelerated some of the concerns and has really pushed people to look at what does it actually mean to look at global supply chain resilience, global supply chain robustness, and to move beyond the usual traditional focus on efficiency. And as I said earlier, this is not just only about PPE equipment, the protective equipment like masks and so on but also about everyday consumables that we consume or about other products that we use in daily lives. So I think this whole idea of a China plus one strategy in supply chain is becoming more popular in terms of at least language. Now, there's a big question mark about how it evolves and to what degree companies actually succeed in diversifying or building the next generation supply chain. And in this context, of course, what we want to discuss in this panel is the special role of India. So what can India do to be part of this global evolution? Uh, what can India do to shape the new global chain as it evolves, as it emerges in the world? And to discuss this very important theme for India, uh, as I said, we have five wonderful panel members. So thank you, panel members, joining us today. And I would like to go in sequence and I'll give each panel member a few minutes, five minutes or so, to make some introductory remarks. And then we'll have enough time for Q&A. So I'd like to request our guests who have joined us for this panel to please post your questions in the chat. I will pick up the questions as we go along. And the questions can be addressed to any one specific panel member or can be general questions. So I'll try and weave them in. And of course, I'd like to request the panel members to also go on mute. You know, that'll just uh, avoid background noise, uh, you know, as a colleague speak. So the first speaker in today's panel is Vanita Agarwal, who is the managing director of TCI Group in India. Vineet, welcome to the panel. Please, uh, you have a few minutes now to share your point of view. Thanks, uh, Professor Sumitra. It's a pleasure to be here at the Horasis uh, first virtual conference. Uh, and uh, I guess in these trying times, it's the this is the new normal. So uh, let me start quickly by giving you a little bit about what we do as an organization. Uh, we move about 2.5% of India's GDP by value of cargo every year. By road, rail, air, sea, we do warehousing, um, and 99% uh, of our uh, revenues come from India. So we get a good sense of what's happening domestically across the nation, and um, we provide all kinds of services. So we have uh, we have uh, more than uh, 10,000 trucks that are on the road at any given time, and with some ships as well as uh, uh, 12 million square foot of warehousing space, we get access to customers and their, their supply chains quite deeply. 
supply chain today is the possibly the most used word in covid today um i think the prime minister in one of his speeches used it something like 14 times so it is a, a subject that has come of uh, age and uh, in india i can certainly say that currently even now after uh, uh, possibly 3 uh, weeks or 4 weeks of complete lift down of or unlocking of the lockdown the supply chains are still disrupted or in some cases uh, severely broken and uh, that process is going to take much longer to restart uh, our estimation is that 50 to 60% of the road transport is active 75 to 80% of the rail transport is active um certain key areas like for example we do warehousing for online retail companies uh they are doing relatively well however certain areas like consumer durables are not doing that well or certain um commodity segments industrial segments are extremely poor right now uh given all this scenario and the fact that there is a clarion call by the uh, prime minister to think about how we can make a, a more of a um as they say in internal growth engines can be uh accelerated and it's not necessarily a uh, inward nationalism but a uh, more of a method of how we can grow internally as well as use this opportunity to also become the export powerhouse for india uh, so the idea would be how can global value chains come to india how do we attract the companies that are interested in a china plus one strategy how can we look at uh, different methods of making our own supply chains in india more resilient it, we have a huge uh, uh, possibly i think about 25 30 billion dollar pharmaceutical industry but uh, unfortunately a lot of it is dependent on apis coming from china so the inte- integrated uh, supply chains global supply chains are at such levels that um, we have to think very differently in terms of how we can not just attract those value chains to india but use them to advantage to become part of the global uh, global supply chains so certain things of course are needed from an indian perspective ease of doing business clearly is on top of everyone's minds how do we how fast can we start companies how fast can we close companies uh, how are the bankruptcy laws how is the ip protection laws and so on uh, and ultimately what is the cost of doing logistics in india uh, from a cost of uh, from the ease of doing business the cost in india for logistics and supply chain is essentially driven by inefficiencies and lack of productivity and not necessarily price so in many areas for example just taking uh, uh, a simplistic argument A lot of the cargo in India is palletized. Is not palletized. It basically moves on head loads, and that itself creates an issue where if you want to create uh, faster supply chains or how things can uh, have less handling and hence less losses in the system, these are some basic things that need to come in place, and manufacturing companies need to put this in place so that supply chains become more efficient and more productive. the other aspect is supply chain financing because the market is so inherently fragmented it is very critical that all aspects of the supply chain from the smallest trucker to even the smallest sme is uh, rightly funded across the supply chain uh, certainly formalization of economy of the economy is started to help you know that gst is uh, one of those areas that is helping to create formal a uh, formal economy but only uh, about uh, 12 million enterprises out of the 63 million enterprises in the country are currently registered under gst so and there are only about 19 and a half thousand companies in india that have a paid up capital of uh, greater than 10 crores so the kind of uh, structure that we have in the economy is extremely fragmented and some of that would be essential if we want to create scales for global value chains uh clearly the other aspect of uh, supply chain efficiencies would come from a shift in transportation modes the the road transport is about 63% of traffic in india that needs to change it's about 23 to about 25 to 30% in china or about uh, 40% in the us 
So if we have to uh, make our exports uh, more competitive and ultimately be part of that global value chain, we'll have to look at alternative modes of transport. These are some of the uh, basic ideas that I had. Uh, and I'm uh, happy to discuss more. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Over to you, Professor. No, thank you very much, Vineet. I think your experience in moving, or at least uh, being so engaged in the internal supply chains of India and moving goods and services across the country is very vital. And it, you raise very important points around how India has to improve the efficiency and the financing of its own internal supply chain. So we'll come back and raise some of the issues based on the time that we have available. So now maybe I move on to the next speaker in our panel, Vivek Agarwal who is the co-founder of In Dutch Ventures in the Netherlands. Vivek. Uh, Vivek, you're on mute, I think so. Yes, yeah, sorry, Professor. Yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, you, have, you have five minutes to share your initial thoughts. Okay. Um, you know, in supply chain, you know, um, China has become a buzzword in the last few weeks. Um, President Trump raised it. Um, you know, he, he discussed about, he has been talking about a lot of, you know, American companies that should move out of China. You know, in India, there has been a lot of discussion that um, we should become Atman Nirbhar, you know, self-sufficient. And that um, you know there should be increased importance to domestic companies. So, uh, in light of these development, and especially during uh, you know the special conditions raised by COVID, I feel that a lot of companies would from operating from China would at least like to shift out of China. So maybe maybe um, I would like to put forward a few points here, my um, observations. Um, I feel that, yes, there is a possibility of few companies shifting out of China. Um, whether they come to India or not, whether India would be able to attract them or not, will be a million dollar question. Vineet raised a few observations as to what are the limitations which India has as of now and which India needs to quickly shed it if India has to attract them. Right? Um, so I would like to take the discussion forward as to what are the limitations which India has as of now. Um, when he talked about supply chain management and the uh, you know, problems in you know, moving goods, you see, India, we have other limitations as well. You see, one is basic is the infrastructure. So here, um, if we can quickly put forward the infrastructure facilities, then, yes, we are in a position to, you know, attract some companies. And here, what I have realized is that the public sector undertakings in India, if they can be somehow motivated and if they can come forward, they offer a ready-made solution as far as infrastructure goes. I will give you some examples. Companies like Bharat Heavy Electrical, company like BEL, Bharat Electronics Limited, ITI, they have huge land parcels of land with all the permissions, with all the infrastructure facilities. So the question will be, how can we motivate them? How can these companies who want to come to India get in touch with these companies which have the infrastructure facilities but are not in a position to really utilize them as of now. So I feel that if we can, somebody can facilitate, maybe the government, maybe some other agency, 
work as a matchmaker with these PSUs, as we call them, public sector undertakings. The work or the you know the flow of these production can work faster. See, all these, as I said, that all these companies they already have the infrastructure facilities, and one very important thing is they have the manpower also. They have trained manpower. and they have access to cheap manpower as well because they have the wherewithal to attract them because of their long presence in their field taking it forward i know it is always difficult working with the psus and i have been an advocate of psus for a long time see taking it forward if we if we see what has been the experience of other multinationals who have worked with psus we find that british gas we find um yes british gas is one ongc there has been lot of uh, you know international affiliations they all have had good experience of working with psu right um, so i feel that maybe it is a uh, time that we reignite our psus and help them in attracting foreign investment especially companies technologically especially companies from telecom companies from um infrastructure power they can these psus can give them um, you know a ready made infrastructure facilities so one was this the other one which i wanted to raise was that chinese companies are also increasingly becoming aware of their presence in india and especially the chinese companies which are into consumer durables they have started realizing that for them to compete they have to start putting up manufacturing facilities here in india so this is a very a uh, dichotomy kind of a situation where on one side on one hand the we find that the government is government of india is raising the bogey of saying that you know any direct investment into india by chinese companies has to go cannot be on an automatic route but has to go through a permission and they are also saying lot of they are discouraging let's let me put the the in the buying of uh, buying of uh, sourcing of products by the indian companies from china on the other hand we find that these chinese durable you know these chinese companies which are into manufacturing of durables they are increasing their presence in india let's take the example of uh, oneplus oneplus phone you know they have come with a big bang in the last few years now they are they have just announced that they want to manufacture tvs and they want to penetrate indian market look at what they have done they have tied up with a local company which is a chinese company based out of hyderabad called skyworth and skyworth will be manufacturing tvs for uh, oneplus similarly we find that um, you know mg motors you know they have you know again come up with their uh, cars and doing very well in india see today uh, their cars are very well regarded to take it forward we find that maharashtra government they have signed an mou with another car maker to manufacture cars in india so what what i am trying to emphasize is that the chinese companies are also becoming increasingly aware that for them to survive in india they have to start producing locally thank you vivek i think you made some excellent points out here in terms of how the psus and chinese companies can in fact to help shape the supply chain in india uh in the interest of time i'd like to move forward with our next speaker 
uh, which is uh, Michael Carlos, member supervisory board of Giver Down in Switzerland. Michael, you're over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Nico. Yeah, just uh, just some background. So, I've spent uh, 30 years of my career at a company called Givadon, which is the largest producer of flavor and fragrances in the world. It's a company with a turnover of about six and a half billion or so, and I've been involved with Horasis uh, both on the India and the international part in Portugal over over the last couple of years. So. I'd just like to talk about three points which I shared with uh, Shimitro earlier this morning. I think the first thing is that when you look at a company like Jivagon, we have about factories in about 30 different countries. And, and we produce basically manufactured compounds. So it's an assembled mixtures which are either are perfumes or food flavors that go into anything like, you know, beauty products or beverages or these kind of products. So we use a total of maybe about 10, 12,000 ingredients. So it's a supply chain which is highly complex uh, because to be short of one, any one ingredient at any one point in time, you can't finish off a formula. So where have we been right through this process over the last few months as we look at it globally? Clearly, I think over the last few months, we've seen that with the COVID situation and the fact that before that, both in the U.S. and in a lot of Europe, there were stronger and stronger nationalist tendencies that were coming through. You could see this in Italy, you could see it in Spain, you could see it in the U.S., less trade, more, more sort of self-sufficiency. And if everybody gets self-sufficient over a period of time, there's very little trade that's left as a result of this. So in this situation, I think what's happened in Europe over the last few months is that I think this tendency of being more nationalistic, people are beginning to go away from this to a certain extent. Uh, Professor, you said in Spain just now, and I can guess you see it in the south of Europe. Italy, the strong tendencies that were there seem to be somewhat weaker. I think in places like Greece and all, you get very progressive governments that come through. And the German-French axis has been pretty strong in, in bringing support to the whole of Europe. But as a result of all this, there has been uh, this over-dependence of China. One has to get very wary about more and more. And that's why this whole attitude of a China plus one scenario. Because in a China one, at least you tend to spread your risk out to a certain extent because the dependence was, was too much. I, I moved to Europe in the early 90s, moving from where I am just now in Hong Kong. And that was when trade was just beginning to open up. And everybody in Europe said, oh, if we could sell even one shoe, not even one pair of shoes, if we could sell one shoe to each of the Chinese, we'd get a billion shoes that we would sell. And even if we sell the second part, the left leg later on, you know, it would be enough. But I think well, within the next three to five years, what you saw was that the shoe was really on the other foot, where you had the Chinese that was exporting just about everything to everywhere in the world. And within five years, all the Europeans started crying with their hands up, saying that you know, this is unfair trade, this is unfair that, and, you know, and putting all kinds of pressures beginning to come back again. And that was because of the efficiency that they had over this period of, of this long period of time. So today there's this big fear of China, clearly. In addition to in addition to this situation, you have also the fact that China is getting pretty aggressive militaristically militaristically and in other ways to quite an extent. So whether what's happening in India, what's happening in the South China Seas. The fact there was a very interesting article, I think, in the Union Express about a week or 10 days ago, talking about China foreign policy during Chiang Lai's time, which was always extremely conciliatory. Today, whereas today it's super aggressive and it's always trying to take the upper hand right from the very beginning to try to put your opponents on a weaker foot. So clearly with this, there is a great deal of animosity that has come about. And that's why we need to try to see how you can 
build on this on this two greater extent. Yeah. I give you a, I give you an example of about how I was looking to build a factory either in India or China to make a whole host of chemical products about 10 years ago. And and being Indian, my first preference was always to put this factory in India. But with the different people that we were negotiating with, it became super complicated. Then we went we went to China and we looked at it. And I liked very much Vivek what you talked about about using the PSUs to try to see how you can take advantage of the situation because very often in China, it's the big state enterprises who set up big new uh, you know, parks, big new industrial parks. They invest in the industrial parks. They provide a lot of the infrastructure. They provide part of the initial manpower there that come and talk to you, that help you to set this up. And then they say in three years, if there's going to be so much housing and in four years, there's a port for being built over here. There's a high-speed rail line, which is coming if you're looking to put a chemical plant in the middle of nowhere. So that's why you tend to go in this direction rather than staying in ours. In the end, we built this plant in Mexico because we made an acquisition. And Mexico was very safe to be in because we're super concerned about intellectual property. And being in Mexico in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of what maybe is cocaine area or whatever it is, you end up in a situation where you're much better protected from an intellectual point of view. The other point I think is that we talk a lot about getting much stronger in manufacturing, but as I was mentioning in the small group the other day, I think is to be strong in manufacturing requires a lot of infrastructure. And and you know, we have we have the best engineering institutes, we have many of the best technical institutes around the world. But unfortunately, many of our best engineers all go to write code. Right? They don't work as engineers. They all end up in companies where they write code. Or they do management, study management, join banks, join financial institutions, things like that. And when we were in Lucerne a couple of years ago, I spoke about, you know, we got into this discussion about the Swiss-German and German forms of education where they split you off very early. You can't finish school, you go to technical training. You do technical training, there are always jobs available for you as a technical person, either in the industry or as a craftsman or something like that. We don't have that kind of thing. China has been built the last 30 years. You know, it's all been engineers who've been running the country for the last 30 years. So I think that whole system of engineering has been deeply ingrained over there. So, so somehow or the other, we need to try to rebuild this. I gave as an example the other night. If you take, if you take our, if you take our motorcycle industry, it's by far the best in the world in India. Why? Because I think over a period of time, the companies have really developed a lot of expertise in this area. They've been able to challenge everybody, and they've wiped the Chinese off the market completely. So, how do we? How we do? How do we do this in a much better kind of way than we have? And I think the other problem, and I need to stop, I guess, in, in a minute or so. So the other problem, as you mentioned, is the over-dependence on Chinese active ingredients. So whether it be in pharma or it's in chemicals or a host of other things, but I think we can overcome all this because one of the big advantages that we have is the rule of law. And I think if we can. And I guess we could go into that to some extent, but the fact that the rule of law is much stronger and you know what to expect in the Indian context as compared to the Chinese context. So Thank you so much, Michael. I think you know your presence and experience in Hong Kong and China add a very interesting and important perspective to the discussion. And clearly, I think as even <clears throat> was mentioned previously by Vivek, it's very it's going to be very, very hard to think of any uh, redesign of supply chain and isolation of China because China, of course, has some uh, possible risks, but at the same time, has a lot of strengths too. So I think how do you combine the two is going to be an important issue. I move on to our next speaker in the interest of time, Sushil Chaudhary, founder of Scandid India USA. So, Sushil, over to you. Thank you, Professor, for the opportunity, and uh, I'm really glad to be here on the Horasis panel. Uh, 
Uh, I'll just quickly mention my background. So I've worked in in US for about 15 years. So seven of those were at Microsoft and some of the big technology companies. Also started a few technology startups. A uh, few of them got acquired. My context in supply chain is primarily around how India, being also a software hub, uh, powerhouse in terms of global. Globally providing that, so my perspective and inputs here will be primarily from the technology and IT sector. I think, uh, as as a country, uh, we have uh, we have attracted a lot of uh, software and IT related work and businesses here in India. To an extent where cities like Bangalore, Pune, Delhi, Mumbai are not even prepared to take that kind of workload. Uh, so. Uh, to give you an example, the way COVID was announced. Uh, so in Pune, for example, a lot of uh, banks and US-related banks are having their technology center where their mission-critical services are run out of uh, out of the uh, the centers here. The way COVID was announced, uh, basically, where a complete shutdown was there. So the the higher management in these banks. Uh, were really upset the way uh, the shutdown was reinforced where even critical functions uh, like making sure that the services are running were not being able to fulfill uh, the indian team were not able to fulfill even that uh, so i think we need to really when we and, and covid is an example but uh, any infrastructure related issue whether it's it's storms uh, basically we we struggle as a country to sort of provide the right support for for these kind of uh, uh, calamities, so I think we need to do better. And and I think everyone has spoken about everyone looking at a China plus one strategy. Uh, I think in software we are already there, but probably in hardware we'll see more of that. Uh, and I think it's an opportunity for the Indian companies to to grab that. Uh, I think there was also a point about what will happen, what will get reshored, and what will go go offshore. I think from a tech, from a Technology perspective, uh, U.S., India, we all realized that we had a lot of dependencies on outside countries for even mission critical applications and services, uh, like you, uh, like the health tech sector in the U.S., uh, supply chain, food supply chain in India. We had a lot of dependency on external countries, even for like military related supplies uh, or uh, or healthcare related supplies. I think we'll see reshoring of some of these. Uh, both uh, in in all markets possibly, right? In US, India, everywhere. Uh, so businesses who were earlier these opportunities does not did not exist uh, in Indian market in the US market. So there will be opportunity to create value to create companies in in these sectors. Uh, the second piece is uh, is offshoring. Uh, with COVID, there was an acceleration of innovation in things like health tech, education. Uh, and, and some of the other work work and mobility around work. We'll, we'll see a lot of these opportunities like health tech, which were very restricted to the US market and that work did, could not come to India or, or let's say uh, the Indian rural sector could not get their piece of work from which where the health interest infrastructure in the metros was super loaded. I think we'll see uh, some of this work will start getting distributed, which was earlier just not allowed because of the regulatory environment. Uh, that will again open up new opportunities for entrepreneurs and businesses to set up anywhere from a US India angle or from India metro to to the sub metro angle where this uh, where this movement will happen. Uh, I think the third point I want to talk about is how handicapped our local businesses are to take any uh, to handle any surge in demand uh, for situations like this uh, or due to disruption in the supply chain. Uh, so, on an average, a U.S. A local business or a Chinese local business has a digital presence to uh, uh, to around forty to fifty percent of these businesses have a digital presence in order of making their services available, in order of facilitating transactions and supplying the the orders. That number in India is close to ten percent, right? and that's a very big difference. Uh, you could see that. Uh, the local vendors couldn't even contact you to supply uh, even pharmacy, uh, medi medical supplies or, or food, essential food commodities and things like that. Uh, as government and as I think as an ecosystem, we really have to see that a second wave of this coming or even a future pandemic, 
how do we enable a local supply chain uh, enable them with technology so that they can serve uh, at least the local communities in a better way uh, i think that's uh, these were the three main points that i would like to say so reshoring uh, and then uh, offshoring of some things which was not earlier available and how do we enable local businesses with technology centric capabilities to serve better yeah no thank you very much rashil and i think your points around the whole onshoring phenomena is going to be very important for india in that context linked to the points mentioned other esteemed panel members also the capability of indian companies you know be it private sector be it i think it's very important to love so uh, last speaker the panel is philip right Uh, the chairman of the Swiss Indian Chamber of Commerce, Switzerland. Philippe, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, also, just briefly to add, I'm I'm also a partner with Baker McKenzie and um, uh, on the Global Steering Committee um, as an EA representative of our Global India practice. Um, so I look at these uh, relationships, trade and investment relationships, both from a um a business perspective as the chairman of the chamber of commerce bilateral chamber of commerce as well as as from a consulting legal consulting perspective and i think um it's been mentioned is the topic of 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 this conversation um that that we certainly will see trend uh, to re re onshoring uh, globally and um offshoring uh, maybe being revisited or certainly outsourcing being uh, revisited but then the question is really um and and probably it really depends on the sectors and and you mentioned um china plus one and of course india as a as a matter of policy naturally tries to make itself the natural um alternative um to china um but i think for some sectors and certainly low margin competitive industry sectors um diversification as such so simply switching from one country to the other is probably uh, is probably difficult so we really i think have to have to look at which sectors we are talking about and indeed uh, what has not been mentioned maybe now uh, or yet is uh, we would also have to look now at another trend we have already been seeing and of course which is now being accelerated which is automation so to what extent will the whole supply chain in at least in certain sectors be become more automated digitalized so yes with artificial intelligence robotics and and that that will also have a major impact and will again be decisive on where will part of the supply chain um go and and when i speak of part of the supply chain i really believe and we see that um also among our clients i mean there's some really saying diversification or getting out of china is not an option for us others say no we take the opportunity and diversify but i think it's really about putting your eggs into different baskets and these different baskets could be anywhere in the world um and of course india has a lot to offer and is a natural candidate but i think as already been mentioned uh, by my um, predecessor speakers um there are really really still challenges so it's not a given um i would still see it as an uphill battle as it was before uh, covid and and it will not change um because there's a lot india from a policy making standpoint has to still introduce or continue in making itself more attractive certain markets more liberalized because that is what at least western companies and and like um Mike before um I'm of course looking a bit from a western and in particular european perspective look at so there are other countries in asia that are competing for this position and um just to give one example and again michael hinted at it i mean we had a period of about 2 weeks where india completely um prohibited any exports of certain apis so it is true that india depends on china to a large extent for the production of pharmaceuticals but this is true for india it has become for many essential drugs a key producer a global producer of, of pharmaceuticals and the impact of such restrictions or outright prohibitions is huge and and here in switzerland for 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 a short period of time imagine we had a shortage and and a kind of limitation on getting 
standard painkillers. And this, of course, goes down, and, and it's not, not only about China, so other countries are kind of also put into that um, basket of what happened during COVID and where do we really depend on. And that's not only China. And, and that's why I'm saying from a European perspective, there will be political pressure to even keep some of the production closer to us. And, and there are other regions in the world. There's Eastern Europe, there's Southern Europe, which are and will become potentially more attractive also from a cost perspective. And that being said, um, I am and continue to be an advocate, and I think now even more so. Everyone is saying, okay, COVID is kind of the, um, the downfall of globalization. And of course, globalization has come under criticism and, and, and needs to be revisited the same as, as outsourcing or offshoring. But I think it also has shown with borders being blocked, supply chains being disrupted both ways, it imports, exports. And again, in the Swiss Indian context, we've seen it with essential um, medical equipment also, which could simply not be delivered in India um, for such major disruptions locally, but also in, in, in the trading um, area that arrangements at the global level, so the WTO being revived, but also regionally, and um, uh, there are free trade agreements still pending to be concluded. I think one should not shy off from the idea that free trade is bad. Uh, probably we will call it differently and more going into collaborative economic partnerships. But COVID has also shown we do depend on trade, and if the borders are suddenly shut for people, for goods, there have been severe damages done to many countries, those that depend on exports. But also, look at India. India wants to produce more Make in India initiative. For that, India depends on technology transfer from other, comp uh, from other countries, including Switzerland or other com uh, countries in the West. And, and, and again, this requires an attractive level playing field and protection of technology. So it's, it's not as easy as to say, okay, India is the automatic um, substitute for China, and it is not as easy to say um, globalization is dead. Um, I think either of it is the entire truth, and we'll see where it pans out. And I do believe that India has, has a great um, potential, um, but it is not, it's not a home run. Thank you very much, and uh, you know we have come to the end of our session, and uh, I think the session could have gone on for another forty-five minutes very easily. We had some so many excellent perspectives. I just want to recognize that three of our attendees have made some comments. So I think Tim, thank the panel members for excellent perspectives. So I think really thank you, panel members. Uh, Avinash makes a comment about how Prime Minister Modi is talking about supply chain and AI as a new generation. And uh, what is true is that you know, most of the discussion, we have focused more on the physical supply chain. I think in the world of digital, there's an increasing sort of data supply chain, if you want to call it that, that is also becoming very important. And we didn't get to touch much on that, but I think the, uh, the sharing of data, the transport of data, the data governance framework across the global supply chain is going to become an increasingly important feature. And the one comment that I'll share with that is that's an area which has not really received as much attention as probably deserved. I think we'll see probably much more work happening in that area in the future. And Shashil uh, raises the point that it's entirely possible for MSMEs to India to manage supply chains and benefit from supply chain issues, but typically important. So clearly, we have a lot of strength in Indian companies. And what I certainly hope is that uh, Indian companies, Indian government, uh, take full advantage of this key moment in the history of the world and the history of India because uh, the Indian government wants to promote more of, you know, make in India and involve India in the global sort of supply chain. And this is a wonderful opportunity to do so. So I certainly hope that the discussion out here adds a useful you know, element of uh, input to other leaders and any leaders who are concerned about this topic. So let me thank the attendees, let me thank the panel members and wish you a successful continuation of the crisis conference. Thank you for the conference organizers also. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.